all done. Right, all done. Great stuff. OK, so um, hello, everybody. It's um, my name is Jill Fraser um, uh, and I head up Mayor Rehab. Um, and as many of you know, um, this is a um, we run this webinar once a month with different subjects that are of special interest to um, people working with clients with complex needs. Um, they can and our subjects vary um, across the board. Um, and the purpose of that is so that our um, uh, rehab assistants and our associate therapists all get a greater understanding of what's going on, possibly with their clients and future clients as well. Um, I'm delighted today that we've got Jill Wigmore Welsh, who um, has just been filling us in on how fascinating um, her work is. And let me just tell you something about Jill before she starts. Um, she is a physiotherapist by background and a psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist and is a health and well-being coach. And if you think about all of those things and apply them to probably the majority of our clients, I think we've got a winner there. Um, she has a special interest in uh, pain and rehab, um, which I get again, I think with the majority of our clients, there is uh, there is an, a, a strong element of pain. Um, she's also a published author and an international speaker. So um, when she starts speaking, you'll see why. So I'm going to pass over to Jill. She is going to um, uh, take over here. And then I'm hoping at the end, Jill, we can have a QA and a um, of any, any questions people might have. Um, obviously, if, it's, um, if you're watching this on a recording, you may need to email um, Jill or myself um, uh, afterwards but um, if you're attending right now um, on April the 28th at 10 a.m um, then I'm sure Jill will be happy to answer your questions so Jill over to you thank you okay so the today is um, about chronic pain and insomnia recovery so this is really all around um, possibility opportunity moving in a forwards direction. So I'm going to take you through the beginning of these slides. I always do slides, and the reason I do it is to keep me on track. So this is what we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to be defining what chronic pain and insomnia are. Uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about the health model, and then I'm going to be talking about the more well model. Now, more well model is with more Welsh, more well, it's the model I use. Uh, the Modern Pain Resolution, which is one of the companies I run. Um, recovery tools. Um, and then we're going to be going into um, a little bit about success and relapses. And then we're going to be going into recovery tool practice. So um, if I just go through, I know this has just been said, but I, I just wanted to highlight again my own background because it's a different background from the average. Um, I originally trained as a physiotherapist. I actually trained as a physiotherapist, not really knowing what the training was. I wanted to be an architect, but my family wouldn't allow me to do that long training. They thought I was going to have babies. So um, instead, I found this degree and went and did it, not really knowing what it was, and ended up doing something that actually I was well suited to because I have this voice and I have the ability to listen as well. But along my journey, I became very interested in the psychological side of it, mainly through working with Team GB. I was Team GB rowing, um, a judo and involved in development diving squads. So that was um, elite athletes. Um, and obviously coaching. So, so I ended up having this array of, if you like, labels and huge numbers of modalities that I can use. I've worked in the NHS and private practice for 45 years now, uh, run my own businesses. Uh, I, I do do a small amount of case management. The complex cases that I tend to look after, um, uh, they tend to be the sort of higher value if I'm going to do something like that. So I, I like the more tricky cases, if you like. And um, I, I do talks on the radio. I'm, I'm a laughter yoga leader, amongst other things. So I often get asked to go on the on the radio just to give a bit of laughter uh, or a talk about sleep or something similar. Um, 
so what else? Well, my story, I actually brought this in, my story, because there is a relevance here with these problems, um, chronic pain and insomnia. And the, the relevance really is because <laughs> I feel like an Alcoholics Anonymous member here saying, you know, hold my hand up, I had chronic pain. Um, and when I was about 15, I was a gymnast and athlete as a child. And I always wanted my body to be more bendy than it was. Um, and I developed a scoliosis, uh, which we all know has got a hereditary, if you like, relationship. And then I developed um, osteochondritis and kyphosis. Um, and I started to develop chronic pain when I was about 15. And that didn't clear until I was 40. So for 25 years, I lived with chronic pain. And I actually also had all the orthopedic and other consultants telling me all sorts of things. I also experienced um, a virus when I was a student and I, I experienced what then became post-viral fatigue. So again, I understand what it's like for people who have ME or post-viral or even the COVID problems that are going on um, because I've had to live with that for the whole time, but it's, it's not limited me. But as I said, I think that um, history, if you like, it was part of my journey. And that's why, I, that's why I put it in, because I consider it's really important that we acknowledge the journey that we've been on as people and how that contributes to what we're interested in. Uh, when I did my master's, my research was all around per individuals' perceptions of self-change how individuals perceive themselves to change, their reports, what's important to them. Um, and so a lot of what I do now pulls together a lot of what I discovered on my own journey of how I went through uh, making my shifts and changes and really what worked for me, because I have a very simple philosophy and that is, well, if I can do it, anyone can. Um, I mean, if I can learn how to do these things and if I can find that these things work, and I can try them out with my clients and they work too. Well, why don't I try it with a lot more people? So as I say, my start off on my journey was very much around the mind, actually very much around the mind. So my first part of my own journey was that I very much, and this is going back to the start of the 1990s, um, I very much got into uh, Buddhist style meditation what is now known as mindfulness um, and thought stilling and control and all of the bits and pieces which which of course now we bring in with compassion and we bring in with cognitive um, processes so mindfulness based cognitive processes etc so my journey actually started down that route and then it went off so I think my, my story is important because it also fleshes out um, a little bit about my, if you like, my mission. My mission in my business and what I do is this, to create and train practical self-development resources that enable you to have optimal well-being all life through while giving back to our community. So I love the how. I love the how. How do I do that? So how can I go into that in depth so that I can actually know how to do this and I think that having the experience of running training courses for clinicians over the years because I used to train have a quite a big training company for physios learning how to do hands-on work and um what they, they came and they loved it oh piece of paper great I can write some I can write some notes and if I know put the paper down actually going to do it and um, once that people get into actually learning how to do things, I find that when somebody begins to start to learn how to do things, then what happens is it means more in their world. And that's when questions start to come in. So I'm very, very interested in creating resources, self-development resources that enable people to be able to make those shifts and changes. Because when we are talking about chronic pain recovery or insomnia recovery, or indeed any of the chronic health problems that we are thinking about a personalized development plan. So we're putting in a personalized care plan 
We, we want to put that person at the center of their care. So if it's you with your chronic pain or insomnia, you're right there in the center. You're at the center of your world. And when we're creating something, the resources need to be specific and appropriate for you. So they have to be something that, that is going to work for you. So I love creating these processes to enable people to have that in place. The other thing that's symbolic with this is you'll notice the lighthouse. And I don't know if you if any of you know the difference between being a lighthouse and a tugboat, but a tugboat tends to be a lot of therapists uh, going and dragging people off the rocks. You know, you keep making the same mistakes and we keep pulling you off the rocks. You keep doing that. Whereas actually, of course, a lighthouse is just churning the way. This is the way to go. Just just down here through this through this path so that you don't hit the rocks. Um, and I like to try to be more of try, <laughs> try to be more of a lighthouse. I won't say I always succeed because I make mistakes as well. So this is what I do. I create and train practical self-development resources that enable people to have optimal well-being all life through while giving back to our community, both a person and me and everyone. So I, I produce journals, I do audio recordings, I run training courses and I work with my clients. So I'm a clinician, I'm a trainer and I'm a coach and I'm, that's what I do. So, so let's go into defining chronic pain and insomnia. So what, what is really important here is also at the background of all of these sides, you'll see there is a little brain. I don't know if you can see it. It's, it's just in the background on the slide. There is, there is a little brain there because everything that I'm going to be talking about today, we, we think of modern pain science, if you like. So we're thinking about neuroscience. We're thinking about uh, the evidence and information that we have that's, that's really now been emerging for, for about the last 15 years years that is there that shows us what is actually happening in in our whole system your brain your central nervous system everything from the inside out and the outside in how we are actually taking information in so we need to always be thinking about that science and the more contemporary way to be thinking about pain or any of the problems so chronic pain and insomnia chronic pain is not to do with the degree or amount of pain that you have. Chronic pain is literally at 12 weeks or after 12 weeks, that's when we start, that's when we start referencing it as chronic pain. So chronic pain is long-standing pain that persists for beyond the usual recovery period, or it can occur with a chronic health condition. So 12 weeks is that interesting point. I don't, I don't actually know who came up with this 12 week notion. One day I'll have to research that. But at that 12 week point, we start thinking, well, the healing should have started to settle by now. If there's tissue inflammation that's there because of mending, it should be starting to heal by now. So why is this pain still persisting? Um, but at that stage, the body is still keeping, bringing up these, sensations of pain um, and associated with that are often thoughts, emotions, um, pain behaviors begin to start to come in. So acute pain is that very early pain, which is the kind of pain that somebody might have, let's say if you had an early stage whiplash injury for want of a, or a sprained ankle, or you fall down the stairs and you, you, you bang your elbow or something, you would expect that pain to settle down quite quickly. But, but if it just lingers and it keeps going, then actually that's when we start saying, ah, oh, this is chronic pain. Now there's a similarity in so far as with insomnia, we can talk about um, short-term insomnia, so, so short-term and long-term. So I wish they called it the same things. I wish they called it long-term pain and long-term insomnia or chronic pain and chronic insomnia, but they have to call it two different things. But insomnia is regularly having problems keeping, uh, such as uh, regularly having problems sleeping, um, finding it hard to fall asleep, to stay asleep, waking up too early and not being able to get back to sleep. But what's really important with insomnia is the way that you feel the following day or over days, because not sleeping really saps your energy. Um, 
I find I find I get sleepless nights at times, and I'll tell you a bit about that because I'm sure the same thing will associate with you. But not sleeping saps your energy. It um, it, it it lowers your mood. It decreases your health. It, your mending and your healing is taking place when you're resting and asleep at night time. So it, it has an impact on that. It impacts on your work performance, your relationships, and your quality of life. So. If you've not read the Why We Sleep book, then I would recommend, I think it's um, I think it's, it's Matthew Walker's book. I can never remember. I meant to get it out today. But that is a book I recommend, and I'll put that down on the list of resources. And the reason being that if you want to try to explain to somebody why, why do you need sleep, then buy that book, because you could just look it from the index at the back, and you can, you can look up the particular thing you're interested in, read those two pages, that will give you plenty of information and then you can go away and explain to the person but sleep is absolutely imperative we have to spend approximately a third of our life asleep <laughs> which is a lot of a lot of your life it's an enormous amount of your life that you spend sleeping um but of course what somebody what sometimes people forget is that you have a 24-hour mind so you have a 24-hour mind that is still going but of course, you are actually cutting off and needing that downtime when you are actually processing, etc. So with your chronic pain and your insomnia, as I say, we're not talking acute pain, we're talking chronic pain, we're talking uh, insomnia, which could be short term insomnia, it could be it could be early under 12 weeks, or it could be longer term. So we, that's what we're talking about today. And I'm actually referencing these as chronic health conditions, because these will be this kind of problem will be associated with so many other problems that you come across. And I'm just going to put this in right now and make a suggestion. It's not already on your list of questions to ask at your first appointment when you do an assessment. Make sure it's down. Make sure it's down to ask about sleep and uh, ask some ask the person that you're um, you're working with or ask yourself how, well how do you feel you know do you think you're getting a good night's sleep are you are you sleeping well and if they say no then that's something to really take account because we know how sleep has such an impact on so much that's happening in our system especially if you're dealing with clients who are rehabilitating and recovering um, and also, if you've got other family members who are involved in the team, you might find that they're also not sleeping as well. So the whole family is is really having um, quite quite a problem. So hopefully that's defined. But then we go a little bit deeper. So the reason I'm going a little bit deeper is because here in the UK, we have to be aware of nice. <laughs> I actually think we should call it nasty, but it's nice. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence. And these are the care pathway guidelines. And I don't know anyone who's been around in healthcare as long as me will know that going back 20 years ago, there wasn't, this wasn't really there. Uh, now there's a set of care guidelines for just about any and every condition. And if you go and look at the NICE guidelines for pain, you will find that in April 2021, they brought out a new set of guidelines for chronic and persisting pain. And in February 2022, they brought out a new set of guidelines for insomnia. When they brought out the guidelines in 2021, they brought out this idea of the primary and secondary chronic pain, which, um, again, is an interesting one. So primary, um, primary pain is, is really pain that is as they put it out of proportion to, if you like, the underlying problem. So where somebody's had a problem, um, but, they're, but they're still getting pain and they're reporting high levels or unusually different levels of pain or it's persisting for longer, then that is your primary pain. Your secondary pain is when it's secondary to an underlying pathology. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because you can have, you can have primary pain and secondary pain. So you, you can have a mixture of both. So you can have an underlying condition and then the magnification of the pain means that it needs to be managed as a primary problem. I hope that makes sense. So the primary problems I find even more fascinating because they tend to be the complex regional pain syndromes, 
they tend to be the fibromyalgias, they tend to be the IBSs, they tend to be all of the, the chronic headaches, they tend to be a lot of the problems that have other associations that I will go into. So we're talking about those problems that you might experience yourself. And certainly when I had pain, when I had my pain, my pain was primary pain. And it would be intermittent, it would come and go. So it was always in the same place. It was always the same story. It was always the same pattern. I always knew, oh, here it comes again. Oh, it's my pain. And sometimes it was so debilitating that I was unable to act, I was unable to function. And then other times that's absolutely fine and I had no problems at all. So chronic persisting pain is a tricky one and it needs interesting management and care. So with insomnia, as I say, the difficulty in getting to sleep, maintaining, et cetera, is all the, the short-term and long-term management. You're going to have underlying pathologies as well with your insomnia, and I'm not going to go into those today because that is something that we're going to be talking about with diagnostics. So we'll leave that over to one side. So how many people are affected? Well, I pulled a couple of slides because I thought you might be interested. One of them says 30% of the world population. Um, others will say up to 45%. Some of it actually varies according to age. But of course, if you're specifically working with people who've got health problems, or if you're someone with a health problem, it might be to 80, 80 or 90% of the people, or it might be with that particular problem, 100% of that population get um, a tendency to have chronic primary pain. So a lot of this depends on where you're placing it. And with the insomnia, insomnia, again, is, is, is very high. You know, the, these, these sleep problems, it, it is a very high problem, 10 to 30 percent. The summer skies, 50 to 60 percent. I mean, this is masses of people who are having problems with sleep. It really is huge problems. And of course, it's the burden, not just on the economics, but it's on the quality of life. And also the relationship between the two, because if you're having chronic pain, you're almost certainly not going to be sleeping well at night time because you're going to be tossing and turning and moving, etc. But also we have to look at other things. So, for example, depression, mild to moderate depression, the uh, number of people with mild to moderate depression and the relationship with things like chronic pain and the relationship with insomnia, the way that you can wake in the night if you are having um an event and I had this recently um something was happening and normally I have the most funny dreams I have hilarious dreams I entertain myself at night with funny dreams but I woke and I had this dream that was so real and I don't know if you've ever experienced this it was so real I thought it was real and I was meeting all these people I hadn't seen for years and it was really oh it was a really dark dream do you understand and it was like this is my mind processing everything that's going on. So I, I've woken myself up in the middle of my dream. And this is what was happening. This is what was going on in my dream. This is how I was thinking. And this is something that you find if you have um, a lot of work that you're doing. You might wake in the night and you might find you're really thinking about what's happening. Now, if you wake in the night and you're really thinking, the best thing to do, and this is one of the, one of the journals, one of the things to do is actually to sit down and just write it all out. Write and write and write and write and write. I wrote the whole of my dissertation, or most of it, in the in my at night. My dissertation actually sorted itself out at night, and I just wrote it down. And then in the morning, um, I, I tried to work out who'd come up with these amazing solutions. So at night time, our 24 hour mind is sorting things out. So if you're waking in the night, then think about what it is that's going on. What is waking me? The worry will wake you. OK, so the health model. I wanted to talk a bit about the health model because I think that it's very important that we we if we're working in healthcare, that we were aware of how things can be structured. Because if you're depending on where you're standing and looking at problems like chronic pain, if you're actually a medical profession, 
professional and you're looking at things. You can be looking at things in a really different way. If you're actually somebody with the problem and you're in that, it might be a model that you really don't know. And therefore you find yourself in this and you're actually, you're actually almost entrapped in it. So, so the health model, The, red, the thing on the side should say classic health, not classy, see, health. But anyway, the um, model here, I referred back, in, you remember to that one where I put that lighthouse up. Now, if you look at this, this is a helicopter coast guard. This is a helicopter coast guard being dropped in. Um, so this is representative it's a metaphor so we're talking about the model you're trundling along in life you have a disease an episode starts an illness an injury a disorder a life event a change a problem etc and somehow you enter this medical system through your gp a consultant a therapist occupational health screening whatever but you enter this system and you get a diagnosis over a process of time so you actually get this label and for many of the people I work with, they have a collection of labels. So they will have, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, which I know it isn't a label yet, but it will be obesity, um, insomnia, erectile dysfunction, uh, amputation, brain injury, uh, chronic pain, and they have these labels. And what happens is that each of these, if you like, diagnosis labels, actually has its own care pathway. And so you will end up through your NHS state, private insurer self or other funded um, situation, uh, going to see spe specialists in all of these different areas. And one of the things that tends to happen with this, this is a sort of traditional model, is that um, a lot of the management is still, no matter what anybody says, pharmaceutical and surgical management. So a lot of it is still, and I observe this when I see solicitors talking about uh, on LinkedIn, sometimes talking about management, they are sometimes referring to uh, medical management using medication, etc. So some of the softer approaches are not perhaps within this model to the same extent. But this is the model, disease diagnosis management, something, the episode finishes and you're discharged and off you go until the next one and that's it. So whatever problem it is, you get to a certain point, you have your last appointment and tick, you're signed off and off you go again. That doesn't always work with these chronic health problems because the reality is that everything is interconnected. The mind, the body, your life, your community, your health, your wealth, your relationships, your trauma, your genetics, everything is related it's all related and um if you start tweaking one area it's going to have an effect somewhere else but not only is that holosphere you and yourself but of course it interacts into your family and as i said the whole community the whole identity you have when you have an accident or injury and you have chronic pain and you you can't have a relationship with with your intimate other you, you that affects that relationship you then get your mind is worrying you think about the future you start to get depressed you can't sleep and the whole thing has this this whole cascade one of the other things that i've put in here you'll see and you might want to look to this if you haven't already looked uh before is these these this 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 area of the trauma tree trauma trees are something that are well accepted now because um, we accept and acknowledge that um, when you have problems um, with pain, um, that horrific experiences um, can cause people to get sort of hopelessly stuck in the past. So, so you're constantly sort of anchored a bit to that trauma whatever level of trauma it may be. And again, in my history, I had, a, I had a trauma, which I didn't know. It was a birth trauma and it impacted me. And it wasn't until many years later that my system actually allowed me to understand what that trauma had been. And I could suddenly go, oh, that makes sense. 
That's left this huge impact and imprint on me. So we know that trauma has enormous impact through life. It has an impact on our self-control, our self-regulation. It has an impact on love. It, it causes us to be chronically um, hyper vigilant and sensitive to threats. So if we're working with our clients or if you have had some experience in the past that's caused some kind of trauma and then you have another trauma, say if somebody's involved in a road accident, I've experienced people who've had um, triggers which have brought out trauma from when their uh, a bereavement has happened um, and, and that triggering has led to them um, spiraling into a, a deep depression and alcohol addiction re-emerging. Um, big problems coming back up with trauma. And I, I would say 99% of the people that I work with who have elements of chronic pain um, mixed with depression, insomnia, it, it, there is some sort of trauma in there that they know about and they need to feel very safe to be able to talk to people about that. Now, one of the trainings I did was um, something called the Feldenkrais method, which is a form of novel movement sequencing. It's only a four year training. Anyone can do it. But one of the things that Moshe Feldenkrais says is you can't you can't do what you want until you know what you're doing. So with a lot of people, when we're talking about people having all the resources they need in coaching, we talk about people having all the resources they need inside of themselves. But oftentimes it, it may not be that they realize that perhaps some of this trauma is causing them to be hypervigilant. And then think of the impact of that on the brain and the cortex. We talk about people getting anxious and stressed because if you've got trauma, and then you've got deeper trauma and maybe you don't know if it's an appropriate time to talk about it because this happened before the road accident and this was like five years, 10 years before. And should I know, but should I be mentioning this? Is this going to affect the case and things like this? It's really important to have those gentle conversations around um, just supporting the client to feel confident and safe and, and referring them over to someone where they can have that. Um, relationship of trust that they can have those conversations um, but but I can't impress on you enough how important it is to actually go and look at all of those trauma trees and actually see the outcomes what what comes up and the leaves and the branches uh, because for me when I'm working with somebody who's got any of these complex problems I'm starting to wonder well What's happened in life? What, what, who are you? Who's your identity? What, what identity have you got now? Who, what is the identity that you've got? How can we support you to actually have the identity that you are, that is truly you, that is really authentic to who you are? And that comes out in sleep. So this is the more well approach. Well, it's not just the more well approach, it's bits of other things as well. But this is actually taken from John Travis. Um, this is his original. Uh, illness wellness continuum uh, I've actually got a slightly different one that I use when I'm talking to clients about um, problems but you can see on the left hand side of your screen if you hear a dog barking in the background it's because they can hear me talking um, on the left hand side it says towards premature death on the right hand side we're talking about high level wellness and you can see you've got signs symptoms and disability and on the right, you've got awareness, education and growth. So if you think back to what I was talking about with that health model, oftentimes people are actually starting to present the signs and symptoms and then getting that problem of disability, something like chronic pain impacting what they can actually do during the day, how they can live, how they, how they can actually get to where they want to go in life, their goals and their purpose, etc. And oftentimes with sleep, it's the same thing. You can have problems when you're thinking your relationships your health your wealth your money uh, your career or it can be a health problem that's triggering something but actually often you can just get brought to that center point when you when we get you to a point of of discharge in the health model we just get you to that neutral point with no discernible illness or wellness and really with with high level wellness or well-being we're wanting to take you higher so wanting to take you up through awareness, education and growth 
But this is important because when you have somebody who has bad sleep or bad pain or whatever, sometimes it's tempting to come in and do a lot of education at an early stage, but oftentimes people want to feel better. They actually want an outcome. They actually want to feel an improvement. And I think this is important because if what we do is we start lecturing and talking to people, we put in too much education in the early days, people need to be um, at a point of readiness to engage. And also they have to have experienced some kind of, ah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll try that, it works. So for example, with chronic pain, it might be a, something as simple as positioning. It might be something as simple as investing in large numbers of pillows and foams and blankets and actually enabling the person to be well supported so that they actually, oh, I can get comfortable now. Ah, oh, that feels better. They need that something at the beginning. And the same with sleep. Sleep hygiene, which is one of the things that we do when we're, when we're working with CBTI, which is one of the forms of, of um, intervention. Sleep hygiene is really a list of behaviors, a list of things you can do. Um, and that's a tick list. So sometimes that gives somebody something to do. And sometimes people find that actually filling in that, oh, I can change those, oh, that's easy. Once they've begun to start to change that, maybe there's some slight shifts and changes. They might be a little bit more open and um, interested in, well, what else have you got to offer? Well, what else could I do? Is there anything else I could learn? Well, how, how else can I try? Well, can I, can you, can I, and this is where, when you're actually working with someone, this is about just sort of drip feeding little bits and pieces in that you think might be successful. But with, with this, this is all about, how do I do it? <laughs> and, and really putting things in at a high quality level and bothering to do, if you, if you just focus on one small thing, one small area, and just take it down and improve that quality, whichever area it might be. And it might just be, for example, positioning, much, much better positioning and, and spending time on really getting good positioning. If somebody's spending a lot of time in bed, really enabling them just to, oh, oh yes, I can just let my skeleton, oh, I can really let my skeleton relax now. Sometimes just, you know, a little tiny, you know, micro towel put into under a shoulder and it's like, oh, oh, I can just let that relax. So sometimes it's bothering just to take that time. And then once that person feels the difference, actually enabling to understand this is something that you can do yourself at home. Micro towel put into under a shoulder and it's like, oh, oh, I can just let that relax. So sometimes it's bothering just to take that time. And then once that person feels the difference, actually enabling to understand this is something that you can do yourself at home. So chronic pain. So what do we do? What do I do? I work with people who've got pain present more than 12 weeks, insomnia, sleep problems that not resolving, lingering fatigue, breathlessness, no mood or mobility, health conditions that limit independence or self-care, failure to respond to standard medical treatment, a history of physical, emotional trauma and injury, preference for a non-drug free surgical holistic approach where they are in charge. That's who I work with. I want them to be feeling that they are in charge of what's going on. Recovery tools. Now, recovery tools. So when somebody has these labels and problems, then they're probably coming because they want a solution to that particular problem. But if you're thinking of a wellness continuum, that's much bigger. So therefore, what we're wanting to do is to enable the person to have a solution to the problem that they say they've got. The problem's a problem to them. So I think there's a phrase, a problem is only a problem if it's a problem to you. And if what happens is that that particular person has problem pain, then they want a solution to that pain. Once that solution to that pain starts to begin to come in and they discover that there's something else that can be done to take them in a different direction, then they might become interested, but just go straight in to the number one problem. So if somebody, if somebody says, oh, I've got insomnia and, and I've got terrible pain, I was like, oh, okay, well, which one's the one that's really worrying you right now? It's like, oh, it's, it's the pain. Okay, let's think about that one first then. How would that be? What would it be like for you? And, it, and that's a really good way to ask, what would it be like for you then if we worked on that right now? And then if the, because right now is now, 
what would it be like for you if we worked on that right now? Oh, that'd be really great. Okay, so shall we do that? Yeah, okay. What would you like? What would you like to have happen if we did work together? Oh, I'd like to have this. Oh, okay. All right, so that's what they want. Get that, get right drilled down to what they want. Sometimes people just want to know what's wrong with me. Why have I got these symptoms? What's wrong with me? Okay, would you like me to explain to you about chronic pain? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know anything about this. And sometimes you want to use metaphors. I was working with a client recently. He's got no educational background. He's been a carpenter by trade, left school, unable to do no nothing. I had to explain everything to do with neuroscience in blocks of three by three and four by four and 1.2 meters and cardboard tubes with bits that go through the middle. And he understood everything brilliantly. I was able to explain to him everything about the brain and neuroscience and what goes on. Um, but we had to use his language. So bringing things into their own patterns and language of behavior and where they come from. So CBT, CBTP, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Pain, Mindfulness, hypnosis, meditation, movement training, for anybody. You'll notice there's a similarity between these two as an overlap. So basically, I bring the recovery tools in. Cognitive behavioral therapy is about the cognitions, the thoughts, but it's about your behaviors. And behavior is everything you do, everything you do, the way you speak, the, the way you think, the way you look, the way you hear, everything. Your behavior is everything. I put mindfulness, meditation and hypnosis there because for some people, some people prefer the concept of mindfulness, some people prefer the concept of meditation and some people are quite happy with hypnosis. For some people, if I mention hypnosis or hypnotherapy, whoa, they think I'm going to take charge of them. So we don't talk about hypnosis, we talk about mindfulness and they're quite happy with that and then I do similar things. Movement training, clinical Feldenkrais. Now, the reason this is Somni moves, clinical Feldenkrais, this is novel movement training. And we know that with the brain, with the cortex, when you introduce um, somebody with pain or discomfort, we introduce novel sequences, interesting sequences, fun sequences, sequences that get the brain thinking. What happens is the, the brain begins to start to open up neural pathways that it hasn't done. And these are done without any efforting. So there's no hard work, which is why I love Feldenkrais, because there's no hard work. It's effortlessly easy and you get a shift because as soon as you begin to introduce the nervous system to something that is different, new, or it's done before, but it hasn't done for a while, what happens is it goes, oh yeah, I could do that. And it just starts fitting it in and it starts to get to be a nice, easy, simple way to do it. So in the movement training that I do, for example, if you've been a dancer, I was a dancer years ago, you can try this now as you sit, you can do it in your imagination. Nobody can see you really. As you go to lift your arm, imagine you're lifting your arm and you're leading from your fingertips. So as you lift your arm up, you're leading from your fingertips. And you can do this as you sit. But then the next one you do it, you lead with your elbow. So you lead with your elbow. And the next one you're going to lead with your shoulder. Now, each of those movement sequences is completely different. Um, you, you could lead the movement of lifting your arm from, from your right foot as you push through your right foot. Each of those movement sequences is different and it's going to stimulate your brain in a different way. Having that variety is often what people lose when they have problems with movement, they always do the thing the same way and that causes pain. NLP, I'm a master trainer in neuro-linguistic programming pattern or psychology, whichever one you want to give it the P. Um, I use all the graded motor imagery. I do still do manual therapy, um, lifting scars out um, and personal development work. So those are the recovery tools where if somebody wants me to be coming in and doing work, I will come in. CBTI is the number one treatment recommended by NICE. I'm trained in CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for insomnia. Um, and I apply similar processes to the CBTP. Um, I'm not sure because I'm... I haven't got, I can't remember if I've got, uh, no, I think I have, next slide. 
Yes, good, that's all right. So um, a little bit about CBTI, because I don't know how many of you actually know much about CBTI, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. So CBTI, there are basically, there are five core elements to CBTI. Um, one is something called stimulus control. Another one is sleep episode rationing. Another one is cognitive techniques, which we talked about. Those are your thinking thoughts, the words, the cognitions, the way you frame. Uh, relaxation techniques and sleep hygiene. So these are five separate um, components. Um, and the start of the CBTI program is, is always an appraisal of what it is that you do. So usually right at the beginning, this involves about two weeks of, of keeping data and it's consistent days. So it's one day after the next, you, you keep data so that you've got information that you can come back to. And what you're wanting to do is to find out what the patterns are, how, how the person is behaving, what time they're getting to bed at night time, how long it is before they actually go to sleep, how, how long it is uh, before they wake up again, what they do when they wake, um, how long it takes for them to go back to sleep, what happens in the morning, do they have naps during the day? You're really collecting a lot of information so that you're able to really um, bird's eye view, look down and, and get a good idea. This is incredible for the client to do it because oftentimes when they do this, this happened with one of my clients recently, it transpired that they were having rests in the day, they were having naps and the nap could be a two and a half hour sleep in the day, which meant of course, yes, they were in fact some days getting 10 hours sleep in the day, but just not in the chunk of when they wanted to have it. So these, this kind of sort of getting the information together is very important and also slightly dictates which approach that you take. Um, and it's, it's quite a strict approach, I, I would say. It's quite, yes, you've got to do this. So it's quite a strict approach and you follow a certain protocol. One of the things I like is called constructive worry. If you're good at worrying, it's put your worrying to work, um, which I think is quite useful if you are going to, if you are going to worry, actually worry about something constructive. Um, change. So change is what this is all about. I have a process that I use, which is called FASTER, F-A-S-T-E-R. And the first letter F is the only one I'm going to introduce you to today. It's the one that's the most important. This is about success and relapses. The, the F stands for fear. So one of the things with change is, is, is it, it change always causes upheaval, whatever it might be, change causes upheaval. Um, and if you have a background of trauma and you've had all these episodes of problems, then um, it, it could well be that you find that the idea of making changes um, how, I mean, how many, how many here have actually successfully put in place a New Year's resolution that's lasted the whole year or done a sort of six months, no chocolate or something? It's hard. The temptation is hard to, to, to make those, those changes. It's hard. Fear causes um, anxiety. Um, and of course, if you've been involved in trauma, then you're going to have that, as I say, hypervigilance. Um, if you aren't sleeping and you're worried and you don't know what's going on and you're into this state of hopelessness and this sort of depression and you're spiraling down and nobody seems to be able to help you, the fear of losing who you are, losing your identity, losing your ability to do, what, do what's happening. This fear also means that you start to negate um, uh, your love, your own self-love, your own sense of worth for yourself, you lose yourself. And a lack of self-belief, limiting beliefs, these are natural. You're not going to have a lot of confidence when you have a lot of pain. Um, you're not going to have a lot of confidence if you're not sleeping well. So sometimes it's important to recognize that people are likely to be 
very scared when they're having these symptoms um, and the effect that this is going to be having on the amygdala in the brain and how that's likely going to be magnifying some of those symptoms. A client of mine years ago, when I came back from a break, said to me, I was on morphine, Jill, while you were away. And I was like, oh, you poor thing. And he said, he said, until 24 hours before you came back, he said, and then all the pain went away, he said, and I realised I was just terrified. And I said, wow, that's amazing that you've discovered that. But he'd had such a huge exacerbation. And as I say, my client, who's just been through surgery um, that I've been managing, um, he has been the same. His magnification of symptoms was massive. Now he's fear has come back down so I would suggest that when you're working with whatever it is look look at what could be scary what could be very fearful and see if there are ways you can actually make life more easy and comfortable um, we can talk about that if you have any questions so what are the sort of practical recovery practices that you can um, put in place um, one of the exciting things about doing the presentation today is the little bit that says it is showing up over one of the words. So I'm having to remember what I've put up. So decreasing fear is huge. Bringing fear down is massive because we know with chronic pain that the, the huge sort of monster of that fear oh, what's wrong? When is it going to go? I'm never going to have the, oh, this is gonna, never going to clear. If you ever want to see magnification of fear, go into some Facebook groups, which I have done, associated with chronic illness problems, and see what people are telling each other. Because the stories of what the person could likely end up with is going to cause anybody to have fear. So tackling that fear is huge as a clinician, if you can tackle that fear, or as a healthcare professional, when you go in, think about the first conversations you have with somebody and actually asking them, hey, what was good about yesterday? And um, thinking about getting them out, out of that sense. Increasing their confidence. Whatever they can do, it doesn't matter anything. Just get their confidence. They're amazing. They're wonderful. You know, doesn't matter. Just get them to feel really confident and good about themselves. It's so important. And help them to rediscover their purpose. This is where um, so often we don't want to talk about spirituality and mission and vision and self-development. But the truth is most people who have an injury or accident or chronic pain, or any of that purpose, they don't want to face the future because what's the point? There's no point in going towards the future. Anything they wanted to do, it's not going to happen now, but it's chronic pain. So rediscovering purpose, which is where when we work with coaching, this begins to start to come in. So working with people to do mind maps, vision boards, anything that you can, you know, anything with colours, pictures, anything, just so that they have some sort of idea of something that they can do in the future and they might have fun. So what are the next steps? Well, monitor your moods. This applies to everyone. We know that if you have mood-led behaviour, it's very different from goal-led behaviour. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, it's not being cosy and warm. I think I'm just going to stay in bed. And then this other little voice says, no, get up and feed the dogs. And then I'm like, no, I'm going to stay in bed. And then the dog goes, woof, woof. And I'm like, oh, come on, just get up. So tell yourself what to do. Goal-driven behavior is what athletes do. But you've got to have that purpose in order to be able to do it. But how much laughter do you have? As I said, I'm a laughter yoga leader, and I know in laughter yoga, um, we, we, we do false laughs. <laughs> You've got a pen in your mouth this way. I'm sure you've done that trick. It makes you feel happier. Um, and do you act according, as I said, to your mood or your purpose or whatever? Increase your awareness. How do you do what you do? What do you sense and notice? How do you feel on a day? What's actually going on? Go a bit deeper. You can read something like the Artist's Way book if you've not come across it. You can read the Artist's Way and play with some of those activities. And change your language. How do you talk to yourself? How do others talk to you? How do you let them talk to you? What do you say? And what do they say? 
Look at the words you're choosing. I did a dictionary a few years ago of all the good happy words that there were in the dictionary. And do you know what? The majority of the words in the dictionary are miserable and unhappy. So spend some time at feet language. Hey, it's great. Look at the blue sky. Oh, look at the clouds. Oh, it's sunny. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. Use some more positive language. We know that if people talk about pain, they feel pain. Get a group of people sitting around going, oh, it really hurts. You can bring your symptoms on like that. You get a group of people meeting and they're going, oh, how are you? How's your pain? It's like, change the subject. <laughs> Don't talk about it. Okay, so the mind is a muscle. The more you use it and exercise it, the stronger it gets and the more it can expand. Those are my free gifts if you want to go there. I will briefly, we've got a minute. I do produce all these journals. You can see them. They do apply. Um, they're great for coaching. If you're a coach, you can use these coaching journals and things like this with your clients. Um, you can find out more about my website, but I'm going to stop now and then I will have enough three minutes for questions. Fabulous, Jill. Thank you so much. I've been making notes, loads of notes. I'm thinking of all the different clients I have and how what you've just said will apply to Diff different parts of what, what they're going through, but there's such a, a common theme. So really fascinating. Um, I've got a billion questions and I know I asked you a few beforehand. Has anyone else got any questions they want to push ahead with me before me? If anyone's a bit shy, you can just type it in the, the chat section. Don't worry about putting the camera on or anything. We can read it out for you. Oh, they can send it to me afterwards. Yeah. That's, yeah, because yeah, we, um, we're doing the recording as well. So we can send this out to everyone. If anyone's got um, any colleagues or clients that they think that this might actually help, um, they can send it to. And then if they have any questions, um, they can email us, you, Jill. Um, there's yeah, plenty of way we can, we can get yeah. the information. Yeah. So, Jill, when you work with a client, would you work with them face to face or will you work with them remotely or both? No, it, it doesn't matter. I can do both. Um, and that's one of the things that's been so amazing working with um, with COVID that I was so surprised at how well people can respond um, actually using a remote system. There are times where I'm working with movement. If I'm working with movements, there can be times where it's easier to be in the space because you need that three dimensional aspect. Um, so, I, I, but I will do both either, doesn't matter. Okay, that's good. And um, it's a couple more questions. So the movement, the working with movement, is that a similar thing to the bow bars technique? No. <laughs> right, okay. okay. Um, no, it's not. It, it, again, I could talk to you for ages about Feldenkrais. What I would say is when I first came across it, it was back in 1990. And it was through a client who'd had this when he was overseas and it was a clinician he'd worked with after a stroke. Um, but it's not a medical treatment. It's a very much a form of personal development work. And it is through movement. Um, and it is either hands-on work but a lot of what we call verbally directed movement sequences in other words lessons and I will put a link in the resources that people can do um yeah. it, but it, it, no it's nothing like Bobas at all nothing okay I have no bath okay training. yeah that's interesting because of course some people just love that sort of um intervention so um I'm particularly interested in your laughter yoga. And what do would you, you like do to that know? In a, well, would you do that in a group situation? Because I guess it's quite a, an awkward thing for someone to do. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I laugh um, at a lot of things, but I'm not sure I could just stand there on my own with someone I didn't know very well and just laugh. Um, I think, I think it, again, this comes through into what you asked earlier. You see, I did the Feldenkrais training back in, uh, what was it, 1993. I really got into it and I spent, I, you know, I still study. But the thing is that in other countries, in um, Europe, in parts of Germany, in parts of Australia, America, 
it's way ahead in terms of uh, people actually doing this. There's loads of like classes of 50 to 100 people going. Um, yeah. And it's the same with laughter yoga. In so far as here, it is a cultural thing. There is a cultural thing. And I did run a laughter yoga group once where a woman said to me, is this all we're going to do? And I said, what? And she said, well, laugh. this is this you're right but this is also about play and when you're saying what you're saying this is about behavior this is about oh i'm an adult i'm a grown-up or oh maybe you know it's silly this is silly we're playing we're laughing and it's like that's perfectly okay so we play games and um yes it does involve actually laughing and it does involve mime and it does involve movement etc but of course yes this is this all fits with being who you are and actually being prepared to feel better and there is one particular thing that if ever I ran a group for you uh, is absolutely guaranteed to cause a huge shift um, in, in in how you feel it's it's wonderful absolutely wonderful I'm fascinated by that. And would you do a group, a remote group for that? I could do a remote group for that. But one of the processes that works so well is actually an in the space, because the one thing that's different about the dynamic of being in the space is when you um, sense, you know, when you have somebody near you and you can just sense where they are in relation to you. And if somebody starts to laugh, you you get that sense of where they are in the space because you're picking up all the the sound bouncing off the walls. Do you understand? So you you sort of get that real connection with a whole group of other people. So I think that's really important because as humans, as animals, we are community beings and we actually like to be in community, in groups. Um, And so I think there is a benefit to actually you can do it without but of course you are just sitting there going ha, 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 ha. and it, yes. it's not the same as if you you know because when you're going ha, 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 and you look around it's like ha, 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 and you see something and then you actually just laugh I mean it, you know we try to make it laughing without any judge judging yeah so there's no sort of jokes or, or, or nastiness or whatever so it's all through play but the true truth is that sometimes when people are playing, you're playing, you, you just start giggling and you're like an eight-year-old child again, just, just giggling, finding it just really funny that you're talking to a pen. You know, it's like, this is really funny. So it's um, it, it's really, I think, there a lot of, with, with a lot of that, I think it's something that is, is, is better in a group, actually. I think it's, yeah. it, it works better. It's like art, I paint, and they, sometimes it works better to do things in a group rather than just doing yes. things in isolation. So, yes, I can understand that. That's just so interesting. Really great. Um, thank you, Jill. Has anyone got any questions before we let Jill go? I just wanted to ask Jill, you've got such a, a wealth of knowledge. Was, would you come back and do another um, training for us again? Might do. <laughs> Put you on the spot, but just thought I'd ask. Well, it's no difficulty for me, to, as you've noticed, it's no difficulty for me, for me to talk. Um, it, it's also about specificity, and I think what's important is 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 to be specific about what you want, because I, you know, I, you're right. I have a lot of things I can bring. Um, you know, I'm happy to come back and do something again in the future. Just say what you want. Lovely. That's great. Thank you so much, Jill. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. It's been just very different to what we've normally done. So thank you so much. Um, And I think that's it. I think if there's any questions that come up, please, um, as Gabby said, please email myself or Jill or or the office. And um, um, and I hope uh, and any feedback you've got would be great. I'm sure that we'd all like to Jill and I would like to hear that. Um, so um, thank you all for attending. Hope it's been as interesting to you guys. I hope you can um, 
remember some of this and if not then revisit it because it's all relevant it's i am sure you all have clients or even if it's not your clients you all know someone that uh, would benefit from something that um, that jill has been sharing today so jill thanks again so much you're welcome have a lovely day and you thank you thanks everybody have a lovely thank day you. thank you bye 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 Thank you.